online. Okay, on to confidentiality and informed consent. So when we're looking talking about confidentiality and informed consent, there's some things to differentiate from. And the first thing is understanding what the difference between HIPAA and FERPA is. And Stacy does have a slide. I did see this slide in the um, ASCA ethical um, issues webinar that was just put out. And um, I'm going to just suffice to say that uh, school counselors really need to pay attention to FERPA. Everyone in education needs to pay attention to FERPA. HIPAA applies to the medical professions, uh, the clinical mental health professions, and it's very rare that HIPAA enters our domain at all. There's just very, very few circumstances and those tend to be with someone um, with IEP or 504 plan with really significant medical um, issues and concerns. So when we are talking about confidentiality, uh, we really want to look um, at FERPA and making sure we're upholding the requirements of that. And um, a lot of people have asked, well, this is what platforms are FERPA versus HIPAA compliant? Just worry about the FERPA piece. Um, also, when we were looking at this theme, uh, lots of questions came around is when do we need to get um, parental consent uh, to uh, meet with students online or communicate with them in this virtual world? How do we maintain student confidentiality when we are communicating with them? And there's two sides to this. There's confidentiality in our space and there's confidentiality in their space. And um, essentially, we can't guarantee that at all, right? We are not in control of the environment. So um, there's some questions about how do we how do we do our best in that area? Um, there have uh, been questions about when can and should we record our interactions with students, and then um, really the knowing what the limitations of virtual counseling is or telecounseling when it comes to confidentiality. So th those are questions that I hope get discussed when people break out into different rooms. Um, the second thing okay, uh, here we have actually we have a we do up oh, that's um here oh, are we gonna discuss this at all among us or um are what, what do we want to do with this? Because I have okay. a poll on. You to, yep, we can actually. Do you want to do large group discussion, Stacy? Um, no, they can use the chat box, but I do have a little poll for you in terms of wondering whether or not your policy, um, or whether your district currently has a policy for informed consent for school counseling services. So I'm going to share that right now. Um, so if you could just answer that question, um, that would be great. A little bit of information on where our schools currently are. Hopefully, you can see it. Uh, maybe you can give us a thumbs up if you can see the poll or not. I don't think anybody can see it. Um, nobody can see my poll. All right, let me see if I can move it over to the screen. Can you see the poll now? Nope. Nope. All right, this polling feature sounded pretty slick, but in reality, <laughs> it's not working so well. So I am just going to stop that. Um, so, Carrie, let's go ahead and discuss these a little bit more um, about the, you know, um, in terms of consent, what are some best practices around those four different themes? Um, let's just spend a couple of minutes discussing that. Okay. So, just be, uh, our our participants aren't going to be able to discuss it with each other or with us, or do you want me to just unpack these at this point? Let's just unpack, um, you know, what are some um, general guidelines, and then we okay, will go ahead them. and have opportunity to yeah, they'll have a chance to talk in um, uh, breakout room uh, about that a little while. Okay, excellent. So let's go back. We've clarified what HERPA versus uh, FERPA is. Um, so when do we need to get consent? One of the things that's really important for you to know is what your district or school's policy on parental consent is. I know that some schools use 
um, active consent, some use passive consent, some use opt out. It's really important to know what is it that you're using. And if there isn't a district policy, I'm hoping that um, there's a uh, school or department policy that you use consistently. And the advice from ASCA is that we follow our district or school's policy for parental consent. And that might look different um, for the elementary versus the high school. And so um, do you need to get new consent if you're working with someone virtually and you used to work with them in your office? No, that consent will carry over. Uh, I think that um, when you're working with a really young kids, it's going to be obvious that you have to work through the parents because kids, some kids are not going to have these emails that they're checking regularly. So um, bottom line is you don't need a whole different sort of consent um, if you've already obtained that. If you need to obtain it, it's connecting with the parents. It doesn't have to be in writing necessarily. Um, I, I guess in this, this is where in the perfect world we'd want that. If you typically require written consent, you'd want that in the perfect world. This is where we have to be adaptable and flexible and, um, and getting that consent and hopefully getting it in writing um, at some point. But we, um, I think we have to in some these instances, as long as we have verbal or written consent from parents, we can move forward. Um, Stacy, is there anything you'd like to add on that? Okay, um, so how do we maintain? Oh, oh, I was just going to say that when it comes, yeah, but sorry, when it comes to our ethical standards, um, what Carolyn Stone has said is that the only thing that's supposed to be in terms of informed consent is really around groups, and then whether or not students are developmentally able to give consent. So those are some factors to be thinking about. And once again, you should always be going back and referencing those standards because those are what guide our work. So if you haven't looked at them in a while, um, it'd be, you know, you can go to the ASCA website. They're downloadable for free. Um, and then there's also frequently asked questions that ASCA has put together in terms of ethical guidelines in this setting. And so that's a reference document for you. So we have lots of resources available as you're kind of navigating, once again, this, this, this new environment um, and this new um, situation on how, how do we do the best that we can do given the, cir the circumstances and the situation. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought up the group piece because um, when it comes to confidentiality in groups, obviously that is going to be uh, even trickier if you're working with people from all sorts of different sites, their home sites, right? And so um, the advisement of Carolyn Stone is to um, make sure if you're going to meet with a group that you're not diving into some of those topics that um, maybe a parent will overhear another a sibling in the home or um, that you wouldn't otherwise want people, the student might not want people to know and maybe keep those interactions to things that really will help a student um, kind of de-stress themselves. So maybe guiding them through um, uh, academic or career topics or the coping skills, doing some mindfulness and breathing and so on. And that way some of the more personal things that maybe had been discussed in group aren't revealed, yet you're still creating that connection and supporting students. So um, other ways to maintain student confidentiality, what you can tro control are things on your end. So make sure you're in a space where you're alone. You can use um, headphones so that no one can hear what is being said by the student or family that you're working with. Um, you can put some white noise so people outside the, your space um, can't hear you. Um, and then on the other side of things, it's really through a email or uh, something, a mail or, or some way to communicate with parents um, how they can um, support counseling program uh, programming by providing a space for their child to meet with you um, virtually are some ways that we can help maintain that, that confidentiality. Uh, questions about recording students. Um, I, I've heard that some schools or districts are requiring that um, all interactions with students be recorded. I'm not sure what the rationale or reasoning for that um, may be, uh, but we have to be really careful when it comes to FERPA 
that every time we create um, anything, whether it's in writing or it's recording, it, is, it can become part of the education record. And anything in that education record can be subpoenaed or requested by the parents. So when it comes to recording any interactions with students, um, you really want to think about why, what, what the purpose of that is and how it might be used or accessed later on. I think this is one of those um, situations that if this is expectation from administration or district or, or what, for whatever reason, this is a really good time to do some um, education about what we do and um, some advocacy for yourself. I think that is really, really important. And then finally, around the limitations, I think, you know, we've just discussed several limitations for confidentiality. Um, and I, just realizing that what we do is we do our very best to create um, an environment and situation where information that's being shared with us or that we're sharing is staying within the relevant parties. That's what we're trying to do. And um, these would be things that you want to continue to think about anytime you are connecting with, with a student or thinking about, about it. And just recognizing those limitations and trying to problem solve around them um, is doing that due, due diligence. I think too that when we think about so um, setting some of those um, boundaries and parameters, we're going to get into those a little bit, but also thinking about what is your, you know, the students and the families didn't necessarily sign up for this either, right? That's something that was intentional and purposeful and how they decided to go into this whole world of trying to interact virtually with, you know, with their, you know, with their teachers and counselors and, you know, educational staff. So how are we also respectful of that family's privacy and their circumstances mm -hmm. and situations? Um, so it's just another layer. So in addition to our, our relationship that we have with that child um, in interacting and supporting with them, but also what's that, you know, um, what's that family's right to privacy? Um, and uh, how do we also kind of keep that into consideration? Uh, what you'll see on um, in the resource guide is we have a list. The APA has actually created some really nice um, kind of a checklist for doing more of a teletherapy, and we're not. You're, we know you're not doing therapy, um, but it just gives some like like a checklist. Of, here's some different considerations to think about um, when you're kind of having those one-on-one -on -one, um, individual um, conversations with students. That's great. That was that's a great add-on. Thank you very much for that, Stacy. Okay. Uh, now we're into crisis response. All right. So crisis response. Uh, one of the things that's really important is that we um, each know what our district or school policy is and procedure is for responding to a crisis. Um, th that is, that's going to direct what you do in those kind of situations. Um, so one of the things then we think about is when we know that process and procedure is what do I have to do differently because I'm not face-to-face -face with the student. So for example, um, let's talk about a student who uh, talks about suicidal ideation. What we want to do is we want to go through the exact same assessment process that we would if the student was with us. Now, um, some, some schools are saying, you know what, we don't want that process to happen that way. We want you to call a, a mobile um, mental health crisis team and let them take care of that. If that's your district's policy and that policy is being applied in this um, new reality, then we follow that policy. But otherwise, we do the same thing that we would do. We, um, we assess for risk and then we do something with that information. I think that um, one of the things that would be pretty standard is that we would stay with that student until we contact a parent. And the advisement of ASCA is that we still try to stay with that student, um, whether even if it's via electronic means, and try either have them go to their parents or try to find a way to contact their parents while we still have them on that, on that call. Um, some people will say this 
feels um, like there's a lot more risk in terms of our accountability in this kind of situation. And uh, this is again where consulting with your your school and your district, your administration, and trying to levy what you need um, in terms of policy and procedure and resources so that you can feel like you're doing uh, the best to uh, support a student is something I really want to encourage. Continue that consultation. But we really do. We follow whatever policy was in the brick and mortar building. We try to we try to follow that same process um, and keep that, make sure that student is safe and, and there's an adult, a responsible adult in their life that is um, taking on that res- responsibility. And so in terms so of our, our... We just actually had a question about, a great question um, from Katie in the chat box. Just wondering if, um, if there's any other consent needed for a parent to call a mobile crisis team. If you need parental consent to call a mobile crisis team? Yes. Um, well, no, the, I would say no. We typically don't have to have that consent to call that team. Sometimes that team is accessed because we can't get a hold of the parent. Um, that might be a situation. One of the uh, things that I was, when I was listening to the Ask a webinar this morning, um, Caroline Stone was saying we always have to let the parents know, even if the risk is really low, right? We need to let the parents know that there is some risk and we want them to be aware of it. And she actually addressed this whole um, crisis mobile team saying it's a really good resource. One of the things we have to know in those kind of situations is, is what do they do? Do they contact parents? And um, as we think about different communities, sometimes those mobile crisis teams do contact parents and sometimes they do not. And so we really have to know what their process and procedure um, is. So, so I think often, though, whenever there is like a, but if we think about whenever there's an emergency, like mm-hmm. harming situation, we, and if we can't get a hold of a responsible adult, there's, you know, then we can break confidentiality. That's one of the other things that's in our yep. ethical standards that, you know, it, it is, it, we can break confidentiality when there's, when there's concern of self-harm. Um, and it's very appropriate because that's the number, that's our, that's our number one priority is making sure that, that, that child is safe. Correct. Correct. And, um, yes, right. Good. Okay. Uh, is there any other chats? questions on that, Stacey? Nope, that was it Just for that one. Okay. So in terms of our accountability, we need to um, do what we would do when there is our, our ethics also tells us if there's risk, even if it's low, um, we need to share that with a, a parent or guardian, except in situations where there might be abuse. Right, then we have to make it we may have to make another decision. But again, we have ethical standards that are really guiding our um, our actions in terms of doing the assessment and um, re- reporting to parents or breaking confidentiality. Uh, we just we do the same it just the pro- the procedure looks a little bit different when we don't have a student right next to us, correct, but the reporting pieces are still the same. So if you're, if you're, let's say that you, you're, in a, you're in a school or district that currently doesn't have a formalized mm-hmm. um, process or procedure, so then that would be important for you to kind of have a conversation with your administrator about, okay, this is something that we need to, we want to be more proactive versus reactive. If you're in the middle of a crisis, you don't want to figure out what that, what is that policy or procedure so that you have those set guidelines ahead of, you know, in the event that the situation does occur, hopefully it doesn't, but just in case it does. Um, and so there are um, there are some recommendations and best practice guidelines um, available on the resource sheet that we're going to share that ASK has put together. Um, and then we um, are also sharing a webinar that the California School Counselors um, Association is putting together on how to support students in a virtual environment. And they have some guidelines as well as some um, uh, online training, um, free online training that's available to help um, to help think about what, what can we do to support our students in that type of um, situation, as well as some information that we can probably share with um, our teachers um, if they have concerns. Uh, so just know that we do have some linked out resources available to you. Great. Okay. 
We want to talk about boundaries. And we're down to 21 minutes. (laughs) Okay. So professional boundaries, a couple things. One, in terms of our communication with students, we want to be really um, mindful about uh, the devices we're using and the platforms we're using. And in in this situation, we want to have some flexibility where we might um, generally not wanting to be using our, having students know what our personal email is or our phone number is, or even use our own personal devices. And some people don't have the luxury of not being able to do that. Um, Districts have different plans, different budgets, different resources. Um, And so we want to make decisions about that and think about um, how that might not just affect us and our families and students now, but what might that look like at a future time when this information is out there or there's information on your device? Um, Like for example, text messages that might be on there. We just want to be cognizant about um, what, you know, who has what information and what information is being um, stored on our devices. We also want to make sure in terms of the platforms we're using that um, we we are using platforms that really promote our um, per, that, that line between personal and professional. And so sometimes this is really coming down to um, that social media piece. Some um, some people are using social media to connect and communicate with students and families. And again, anytime, I'm not saying that you can't or shouldn't, and ASCA isn't saying you can't or shouldn't, um, but we really want to think about uh, what might be some of those ripple effects when we make those decisions to use our, um, our personal devices or we choose to use social media platforms. Stacey, is there anything you want to add on that? Um, we actually had a couple different questions. Um, someone was asking in terms of uh, if anybody's had positive experience using Google, um, the Google Voice phone numbers. Um, it looks like someone is looking at um, using that. Um, and uh, what we have heard is that, yes, um, districts are using that, and it has been positive, um, especially because it allows the option to do texting. Um, we know for a lot of our families, texting is um, they might be more responsive, um, as well as our students to text versus listening to, um, uh, you know, wanting to do phone calls or things like that. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, that is an option. Um, we're gonna we, we're gonna break you into um, some breakout rooms, and hopefully you'll be able to have a chance to talk a little bit um, about that. Um, someone asked also a question about Zoom, um, and uh, Zoom has an option to either save it to the cloud or save it to your computer. Um, so. Once again, we're going to refer you back to having these conversations with your district um, mm-hmm. or your schools and working with your administrator in terms of, um, you know, what, what are approved platforms that you have because, um, you know, they have done, they should have done due diligence in terms of looking at what are the FERPA requirements, you know, how does it impact student record retention, all those kind of things. And if, it might be um, in terms of the advocacy. There's some questions that you have um, and you talk about with your administrators. Um, to be to be thinking about that. Um, so I would I would highly encourage um, if you haven't had that conversation that you do have that conversation with your administrators. Um, and as our WISCA has actually created a position statement on communication that basically says that you know considerations that we need to be taking in terms of helping us um, uh, maintain our boundaries um, and not not run into this kind of dual roles potentially um, by um, kind of merging our our personal versus work um, communications with students and families. Perfect. The last boundary comment I want to make really has to do with how we structure our time. Um, lives are really turned upside down, and so uh, the the students that we are connecting with and the families we're connecting with may not be available during the school day, and certainly that's a reality. Sometimes that's um, when we're in, in the building, too. We have to find time outside a regular school day to connect with particular families. But what's happened with everything being online and we're in our homes, um, we could work all day long, right, and, and still be trying to meet the needs of the students that we're working with and to make us feel like um, we're doing due diligence. So the, there's good advisement from all, all of our professional counseling organizations to really set t- 
time that is work time and and keep personal time sacred so that um, we are able to uh, meet the needs of students and communicate to families and students when that time will be and when we're off, off the clock. That will also help you if you are do, using your own device, your own phone, that um, if you see a number you don't recognize or you know it's a student or family and it's your personal time, um, that there's not the expectation that you're going to be answer, you're going to answer that call. And in the Ask a Webinar, they talked about that. Structuring your ta work time versus personal time is really important for this boundary piece. And it also allows you then time to uh, rejuvenate and engage in self-care and because we ethically also need to do that so that we can continue to serve in an ethical manner. So I think the other piece that we have is how do we communicate with with um, our students and families resources if they need something when it's off hours. Um, so our, do we have something in our email signatures? Are you going to have something on a, mm -hmm. a voicemail? Um, are you going to have something on your website? Um, so think about how we're informing families of how they can access support um, if there is some type of crisis or emergency that needs to be addressed after hours or when you're not available. Great. Okay. All right. So I think we're ready. We, like I said, we, one of the things that we, um, we have heard from folks is they really like this opportunity to um, uh, discuss among each other. Um, so we're going to put you into breakout rooms. You're going to randomly be assigned to a breakout room. Um, and there are no facilitators. So what we're going to need you to do is assign someone to be the facilitator, the recorder, um, and that's just because we'd love for you to kind of put your comments and feedback into the chat box at the, um, when you come back to the main session. Um, and then um, hopefully we'll have a little bit of time where you will be able to um, um, uh, share out at least from a few groups um, so that we can, um, you know, have a little bit of discussion at the end. Um, so we'll Um, I think we may have lost Carrie. Hopefully, she'll no, be I'm able here. to pop back. I'm here. Oh, you're here. Great. I'm here. Um, should we just call on one or two of the breakout rooms to ask them to kind of share share out um, some of their experiences? And if we can have the reporters, please make sure that you just enter, um, you know, a couple of notes from your discussion groups that we can capture that um, and be able to share that um, and share that with. Um, uh, you know, the rest of the folks uh, that are, you know, that have been on the call. Um, we always think it's it's great to be able to collaborate um, and share those resources. Uh, so I, if who if who is a reporter for um, just breakout room five, if you could, um, you know, uh, um, raise your hand or put your name in the chat box, I'll get you unmuted so that you can do a quick share out. Katie, let me find you, Katie. All right, Katie, you should be unmuted. Katie. All right, can there you hear me? We can. All right, so this is what our group discussed. First, we had a question about legality on having one-to-one -one sessions with students. Um, we have a really awesome digital media specialist um, here at our district and she's really, really thorough. She brought up with teachers that there's, it's illegal to have one-to-one -one sessions with students. So she recommend not doing that for teachers um, because it can just be a little gray. Obviously right now it might, there might be some exceptions to that law, um, but we wanted to bring that up here. We didn't really have a lot of answers in our breakout session. Um, so we wanted to bring that up here, um, but things that are working well in other districts is that um, using the Google Calendar to create appointments for one-to-one -one students. Um, I just created this for myself and I'm gonna try it out next week. Um, there's a YouTube video that describes this really well and how to do this, where students can use their school account to set an appointment with a counselor 
and it's um, and then you can set an appointment to have a one to one session with their counselor um, through zoom or Google meet and then someone else in our from Middleton said that Google voice is really nice for their district. She said that you can use your personal email account to get it for free um, at your discretion. And then there's a really good ask a webinar that you can listen to about that. Excellent, excellent, thank you. And I, you know, Kitty, I would, uh, I would welcome talking to you a little bit more about um, what, what your technology coordinator found and then what, what does that mean for um, a school counselor? Um, in, in, you know, kind of what was the intent of that law or policy? I'm guessing it wasn't necessarily because of this kind of current situation that we're in. There might have been some other, you know, some other things around that. So um, what we'll do is we'll follow up with you um, after the um, webinar to try and find a little bit more and then make sure we share that out with folks so that we all have that information. So thank you so much for bringing that to our attention. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Well, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, we're at uh, 1.32 already, um, and I, I so appreciate your um, grace and patience with us as we kind of work through some of our technology issues today. Um, and uh, just want to let you know that, um, once again, this information, um, a recording of this uh, of our webinar um, today will be put on the website. It, the breakout rooms were not recorded, so just so you know, um, you'll see just kind of a blank screen. Um, and then we will also have a link to the resources, as well as um, the notes from the chat box um, of what your different groups discussed uh, in terms of some resources and support. Uh, there's lots of additional resources as well on that website. Um, so please, uh, you know, check in there. Uh, we also push a lot of information out on um, our social media. Um, so that's where you'll find the most updated information. We do try hard to make sure that our website's updated. And lastly, um, here is contact information for both Carrie and myself. Um, so we we both really appreciate your joining us today. Um, and thank you so much, Carrie, for um, working through and being really flexible um, when we ran some of technology issues. And if you have any closing words that you'd like to say. I Thank you. I want to say thank you. And this is what we do, right? We adapt and we conquer when we have a technology issue. So I think that's the, that's the reality for a lot of us um, the, over the last two or three weeks, I think. So I, I do encourage you to go to the WISCA website. And if you do use Facebook, I have found an enormous amount of great information that Stacey's putting out there um, from WISCA. And our members are uh, replying with equally wonderful um, information and good questions that can, we can help answer. So thank you, and I hope you have a great weekend. Okay. Thank you, Carrie, and I hope everyone else has some time for their own self-care this weekend. Take care. Mm -hmm.